Okay, I'm going to read something and forgive me. No. I want to go here. You're face to face with God. <laughs> Bone cancer in children. What's that about? How dare you? Mm. How dare you create a world where there is such misery? That's not our fault. It's utterly, utterly evil. Why should I respect a capricious, mean-minded, stupid God who creates a world so full of injustice and pain. In this video, you will hear the most fascinating dialogue between the popular psychologist Jordan Peterson and the world-famous actor Stephen Fry. And at the end of the video, I want to add my own thoughts and give you the most convincing evidence of why I am not an atheist. I know, and I'm, I'm not and trying, I'm not course, really not trying to put you on the my, spot. My point is, I don't believe there is such a being, but if there were, and he were the kind of being that has been worshipped and described by various religions around the world, monotheistic religions, then I would have many bones to pick with him. Um, but of course, I don't believe there is such a thing. Uh, it is it is very hard to square this loving God who has a knowledge of every hair on our head and adores us and, um, and adores little kittens. But he also, as I say, bone cancer in, in, in children, but also life cycles of insects that whose whole aim is to burrow into the eyes of children in Africa and and lay their eggs there and cause blindness for those children. So let's take the argument you made there. And to, there's, a, there's a direction that goes in that's nihilistic and resentful and vengeful and angry and all understandable. Yes. But to me, counter it doesn't look to me like there's anything good in it. It looks like it's entirely counterproductive. It makes the problem it purports to have been generated by worse. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it so, it, so the then error. the question is, what's the appropriate attitude, given that the argument you make is actually an extraordinarily powerful argument? And I don't know the answer to that, but I, but I do know, I think, that resentment and anger, and even the motive that would make you want to say that to God himself, I think that's probably not helpful, <laughs> even though it's so, well, <laughs> it, I came to that with great difficulty. I mean, I've had my reasons to be resentful and angry, especially recently. And because I'm suffering a lot of pain yeah. and yeah. it makes me resentful and angry and wanting to shake my fist. Yeah. But I found upon intense consideration that there was nothing in that that didn't make it worse and that therefore that must be wrong. Even though it's justifiable. The truth is this, every single person who is watching this video right now will one day experience suffering and pain. And some of you watching it might actually already be in the weight of it right now. The weight of the suffering is so big on you, you feel like you're being crushed by the pressure of life right now. And there is a temptation, as Jordan Peterson said, there is a temptation for us to shake our fist at God and say, why God? And you know something? It is okay to take our frustrations to God. It is okay to say, God, I'm struggling here. There were many men in the Bible who, who did tell God, I don't understand this. But as Jordan Peterson sort of alluded to, the why question doesn't often get us very far. Instead, we should say, what are you trying to teach me through all of this, God? And when we ask that question, that is the moment that God takes our hand and he walks us through the valley of the shadow of death and he gets us to the other side. Yes, we might be beaten. Yes, we might be broken, but he always gets us to the other side. Okay, the interview is about to get very, very deep, but please stay with it because if you grasp this argument, I think you'll struggle to ever doubt the existence of God ever again. I mean, you used a phrase earlier that I, I, I wanted to say, whoa, hang on, I'm not sure I know what that means, a higher mode of existence. Show, show me an example of it. Show me someone who has a higher mode of existence than I do. Uh, or the I, I can I can answer that, I think, yeah, to the, some degree. Yeah, three yeah. ways. Mm. Three ways. One, that higher mode of existence is what your conscience tortures you for not attaining. Right. Okay. Okay. I, I think so what defined... my conscience tortures me for not attaining is that I was rude to someone yesterday and I shouldn't have been. R right. But it's the shouldn't part of it. Yes, the obligation. It's the T. Exactly. Uh, David, well, and, David and, Hume, and then, well, the, the problem of ought. Yeah. Well, and then you think you think you think about how it manifests itself. Mm. You don't. This is why Nietzsche was wrong. You cannot create your own values. Right. The values impose themselves on you independent of your will. 
Now, maybe there you participate. Well, that's what your conscience does and good luck trying to control it. Did you catch that? Jordan Peterson just said, values impose themselves on you, independent of will. And that, my friends, is why I can never ever be an atheist. If you're an atheist right now, if you're a skeptic, if you're someone who doesn't believe in God, my question to you is this, where does morality come from? In my mind, and I could be totally wrong about this, but I think there's three places where morality comes from. It's either number one, it comes from the individual. We as individuals create our own right and wrong and we decide what is right and wrong according to our own values, our own principles. Number two, morality comes from society. We as a culture, we as a nation, collectively as people, we decide what is right and what is wrong. Or number three, morality comes from God. There is a divine lawgiver who decides what is right and wrong. Okay, number one, supposing morality starts with the individual. Let's think about Ben and Jerry. Ben is a thief, he's unkind, and he gets tremendous pleasure from stealing from his neighbor, Jerry's house. He loves it, it gives him a rush and adrenaline, and it makes him feel happy. But Jerry, on the other hand, whenever Ben steals from him, he feels tremendous despair, tremendous pain, tremendous suffering, and it breaks his heart. Who's right and who's wrong? If both people are equal, if both individuals have different morality systems, who's to say that Ben's wrong and Jerry's right? If you're to be consistent with that worldview, you've got to say, well, neither are right. Morality is just like a choice. Whether I want to help this man or I hurt this man, both are equally okay because we create our own morality system in our minds and each individual has a different morality system to the person next door. If you're a person who believes that morality is relative, can I ask you a question very gently? Can you live it out? I hope this never happens to you, but imagine if one of your family members was murdered and you go to court and there in front of you is the killer. Can you honestly look that killer in the face and say, I don't really believe what you've done was evil. I don't really believe what you've done was wrong. No, every single part of you is gonna look that judge in the face and say, I want justice. That person has done wrong and there is such a thing as something that is absolutely wrong, that is absolutely evil. Okay then, well what about number two then? What if we as a society come up with our own rights and wrongs? What if nations, countries, we collectively say we need a set of rules so we can live together, we can structure together and we can survive together. That's where morality comes from, right? Well, do you remember the Nuremberg trials? At the Nuremberg trials, the Nazi leaders were judged by other nations of the world for the Holocaust, for that terrible monstrosity where millions of Jews were killed under the Nazi rule. And the Nazi leaders thought they had a strong argument. They said, it's sheer arrogance for you in the USA, it's sheer arrogance for you in Britain to judge us Germans for the way we lived. We had our own moral law, we had our own way of living. What's to say that your nation has a better moral system than our nation? We thought it was good, it was right to exterminate Jews. How do you know that your moral system is superior to ours? That's sheer arrogance to me. But then, the chief prosecutor, a man called Robert Jackson, stood up and he silenced every single one of those Nazi leaders by saying this, you know that's wrong because there is a law above the law. And that leads us on very nicely to number three. Of course, morality must come from God. If there are laws, well, there must be a divine lawgiver. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or excuse them. Of course we know that murder is wrong. Of course we know that the Holocaust was absolutely evil, and no one in their right mind can stand there and say, oh, it was relative, it was just a choice, it was okay. No, we know it is wrong because God has given every single human being on this earth a conscience where we know the difference between right and wrong and so we have no excuse. And yes, you can suppress your conscience. Yes, you can sear your conscience like those Nazi leaders did and say we're going to continue doing what we want but you will not silence the voice of God. And every person listening right now, you have a conscience and you know the difference between right and wrong. Why has God given you that conscience? So you know what sin is and you know that when you tell a lie, you know that when you steal something, you know that when you're arrogant, when you're proud, when you're lustful, you know that it is wrong. Even when you might say it doesn't hurt anyone, when you see something on the internet that's rude for the first time, you feel guilty, you feel ashamed. Why? Because your God-given conscience is crying out saying this is wrong. Even when you judge someone and they know nothing about it, your conscience convicts you and says that is wrong. Just like Stephen Fry said, I shouldn't have been rude to that person. When you use the word 
should. When you use the word ought not to, you're crying out to a higher power, to God. So what do I want to say to you next? If there are any of you right now who have a guilty conscience, who know that you have sinned, I plead with you, come to the Saviour who took all of our sins, all of our wrong in his body when he suffered and died on the cross so that we could be forgiven. He'll take that guilty conscience, he'll soothe it and he'll wash you white than snow. All that is unclean, all of your sins will be washed away so that you can be pure and righteous in God's eyes and it's there for you as a gift. I'd just like to apologise to every single one of you. I hate touching on these topics so briefly because there's no way you can answer these massive big metaphysical questions in just a few minutes. So I didn't really talk much about suffering and why God allows suffering and I, I really do struggle with that question myself. But I have made a video before all about it. If you'd like to watch it, please click here. If you'd like to see the full interview with Jordan Peterson and Stephen Fry, please click here.